Hello and welcome readers to the second season of the Vidarbha Literary Festival, your friendly and all-inclusive lit fest. Ye public hai, ye sab janti hai. This might not be as true as it was once upon a bygone time. When I think of the nuances of public policy, I am aware of, I barely come up with a precious few. Needless to say, the voice of the public is imperative to any and every public policy being made with regards to them. However, such is not the case. We often don't raise questions or queries to the establishment who espouses the policies. And to act like a salve to this burn but also a herald, we have with us today Mr. Pranay Kotasthane discussing his book, Missing in Action, wherein he discusses India's tryst with public policy making. As the Takshila, uh, as the Takshila Institution's Deputy Director, Pranay Kotasthane oversees the institution's high-tech geopolitics program and teaches courses on public finance, international relations, and policy at the graduate and postgraduate levels. Pranay Kotasthane began working in public policy at the Takshashila Institution in 2014 after earning a B.Tech in Electronics and Communication from the National Institute of Karnataka, Suratkal. He graduated from Takshila's graduate course in public policy in the fifth cohort, where he won the Gomtibai Govanji Award given to the cohort's top student. Along with writing for the public policy newsletter, Anticipating the Unintended, he has co-edited the book India's Marathon, Reshaping the Post-Pandemic World Order, and co-hosts Pulya Bazi, a popular Hindi-Urdu podcast on politics and policy and technology. We're delighted to have you here with us, sir. We're also pleased to have with us today Dr. Vinay Kumar Singh, our moderator for the session. Dr. Vinay Kumar Singh is an Indian Revenue Service Officer from the 1995 batch. He has worked for the Indian government in a variety of capacities, including as an assessing officer, an undersecretary, and later as a director in the Ministry of Finance and at the National Academy of Direct Taxes in Nagpur, where he is now the additional director general. In addition to earning his MBBS and MD in medicine, he also holds master's degrees in public administration from the National University of Singapore and public finance from Tokyo. Additionally, he served as the member secretary of the Committee on Taxation of E-Commerce and a member of the Justice Iswar Community for the Committee for the Simplification of Income Tax. Additionally, he served as a surveillance medical officer for the National Pulse Polio Project and the Cabinet Secretariat. Public policy is one of his ardent passions. May I now request our moderator to kindly escort our author on stage to commence with the session. Over to you, sir. So welcome tonight to Nagpur. Thank you. I hope you're doing well. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have gone through your book and uh, I think some of uh, the audience would have also or maybe they will be going it after after our session at least. So uh, let's begin with yourself. Tell us a little bit about uh, your own self, your family, your interests, education, background, etc. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, Nagpur. Thank you for being here. So uh, first of all, I, I know this is lunch time, so it's very difficult for us to keep people awake. I, uh, let's try, okay. So, uh, for, and the second thing is, I'm feeling partly that I'm giving a Viva exam because Vinay has been my teacher in public policy on many occasions. So, I'm slightly nervous, but uh, I'll hope I'll pass this exam, Vinay. I'll ask you the grades at the end of this session. So, huh? yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but he should know, he's taught me, so if I can't answer, we can blame him. Uh, so, uh, 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 beginning with, actually, uh, nothing much to say about myself, pretty boring uh, or, yeah, unspectacular uh, beginning, but I would just say that 
<laughs> I stayed in Goa for most of the time. I think that was a cool thing. So, uh, did my education there uh, and then got into like the rite of passage in our times, did engineering. And, uh, uh, and then I was doing chip design for some time. Uh, so, uh, that was my interest. And after that, I was also interested in public policy way back in 2008-9. And as you know, at that point of time, one, the only way that you can think of public policy is through the UPSC exam. So like you, I tried for UPSC, but unlike you, I failed twice. So I couldn't get into uh, any of the UPSC uh, positions. And after that, I just continued working. Um, I enjoyed my work uh, at... Uh, 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 doing chip designing, etc. But then I got uh, interested more. I, I had that you call na kida in me. Ki you should know something about public policy, even though I, I haven't gotten through this exam. And that's where I stumbled upon this course at Takshashila Institution in public policy. And then I started doing that and then changed my career track and came into this field. Uh, but broadly, right now, uh, I teach public policy uh, and at the course that I learned back then and you were teaching. So uh, I, uh, I teach public policy. I do research in uh, foreign policy mainly. Uh, and my current research area is semiconductor geopolitics because that's where my two worlds collided. And there's so much talk about it right now and I've been working over it, uh, on it for the last two, three years. So that's, that's pretty much it. So, uh, public policy and semiconductors. Yeah. I mean, these seem to me, you know, uh, poles apart. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, how are you able to manage, I mean, both of them together, right? You are working on public policy, I, I understand. Yeah. At the same time, semiconductor is such a kind of a technical thing. Is it, is, is, is it the thing that, uh, basically relates to your educational background. Yeah, so that's the fascinating thing. Just two days ago, there was a, uh, uh, an, an ICET uh, sort of a de um, um, an agreement signed between the US and India. Uh, and it was about national security. But one of the areas in that was semiconductors, right? So there was Ajit Doval, who's the NSA, and he is, uh, they, uh, with the Biden administration, Jake Sullivan, they were talking about semiconductors and what can be done in India on this. So it's fascinating. Never before uh, had I thought that I will read the words Ajit Doval and semiconductors in the same news article, but here we are, right? And it is actually, there's a lot of talk about public policy related to semiconductors now, right? Like what should India be doing? Should India have a fab on its own? Given what's happening with China, there is a lot of talk about these things. The government has been trying to get an ecosystem of semiconductor companies uh, in India. So actually both things have collided some uh, in a pleasant way and uh, they are sort of uh, we are when I talk when I'm talking about semiconductor uh, geopolitics, etc. I'm talking from a policy angle. It is technical, but it falls under the wider domain of technology policy, which has become quite a core thing that the government is doing. You know, sometimes I feel, given the economy-wide impacts of their decisions, the METI, which is the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, is probably one of the more important ministries now, right? Like, look at the things that they're doing on, say, ONDC, Digital Public Infrastructure, Data Regulation, Semiconductors, all of that is being done by one ministry. So, in fact, technology policy has become one core area of focus for the union government because of the geopolitics around it, because of uh, the fact that technology is an important element of national power is being widely recognized and that narrative has changed. So I think now these things have sort of merged. Yeah, so I can see the passion, I mean, your passion in semiconductors, policy related matters. And uh, I think we'll continue our discussion after this session outside, but right now let's move back to the book. So. Uh, how, uh, how did you, I mean, embark on this project? How, how, what exactly made you uh, write about it and made you, uh, how did you connect with the, your co-author, Raghu? Yeah. This. So, uh, yeah, I'm a co-author, so uh, this is a joint work. 
uh, and both of us connected through the course that uh, at Takshashila. So I was a student of an earlier cohort and he's a student of a later cohort and uh, that's how we came to know of each other. Now there are like a 4,000 strong community of people uh, through Takshashila who know about public policy, who have learned the fundamentals about it. So that's how we connected. And our objective uh, right from the beginning was uh, what you said right in the beginning, right? That there is a famous uh, uh, song, right, from the movie Roti, where Rajesh Khanna says, Ye public hai, ye sab janti hai. So our idea was when we talk about public policy, ye public sab nahi janti hai. In the sense that there are some, uh, everyone has views on public policy, right? Everyone here, I'm sure, has a strong opinion on what government should do and shouldn't do, right? And we, uh, like, we fight on it, like, it's Sachin Tendulkar versus Rahul Dravid or something like that, right? That is so passionate about a policy or an idea. But the, uh, so our, uh, and this is the training that I've got from Takshashila while learning that it is important not to think about intentions of public policies, but to think of consequences of public policies, right? And once we think about consequences, we want to evaluate whether a policy makes things better off or worse off, right? So that kind of thinking is the way that we should decide whether something should be done or not. Uh, but we often don't because we are passionate about what the government should be doing. So that is something that we always had at the back of our mind that, uh, you know, there are enough people who talk to the policy makers, right? And I mean, you are in the government, you know about public policy much better than I do. But what uh, we thought we should do is we should connect to the other end of the policy pipeline, which is us, the citizens. And the idea was that if we are able to understand public policy better, two or three things will happen. One governments will not be able to take us for a ride, like say something is good, but even though we know that there are uh, negative consequences, but just because it becomes an emotional subject, governments can do that, right? It's like say demonetization being an example. Uh, second thing is, uh, we should be able to sharpen our demands from the government. If we know public policy better, we'll be able to realize, at least to an extent, that there are limitations within the government. There are uh, government, what is the state capacity limitation? Uh, it's, it's not enough to say that government should do something just because it is good to be done, right? Government involvement in a particular area has other consequences. There are opportunity costs. Government spending money on one thing means that it will have less money to spend on the others. So these, this is the second idea. And the third one is just to improve the public discourse. Again, a lot of our discussion is about either intentions of a public policy or even about sometimes one person because that person has said this policy should be done, we all will champion it or like it. But that's not how we analyze public policy, right? So these were some things with which we started uh, and uh, we, thought, we thought how do we address this? So first experiment that we did apart from the Takshashila courses was we started a podcast in Hindi Urdu where we discuss public policy generally, uh, try to discuss semiconductor policy or uh, things which happen on a daily basis to test this idea of uh, taking core concepts of public policy, right, opportunity cost or, uh, you know, state capacity to a wider audience. So that was the first experiment, it, the podcast is still going on. And the second thing we did then is start a newsletter and that newsletter we've been writing over the last three years every week and there we discuss uh, core concepts of public policy explained in a way which will relate to a broader audience. So that was the beginning and while writing the newsletter after we had around 130 editions or so, uh, I thought we had enough content to write a book actually. So uh, that's how the book wasn't planned. The, when we had written enough, uh, the publisher said, you know, you have content, why don't you convert it into a book? So uh, that's how the book came into being, right? So th that's the motivation and our strong belief in all this is the idea of the Overton window. Now the Overton window is a concept which says that uh, the range of 
any socially acceptable positions on an issue is always narrower than all the possible uh, positions that you can take on an issue. So basically it says there's a window uh, within which ideas are not considered not radical, ideas are considered acceptable. And generally people in the government and especially in a democracy want to be in, within that overton window. They don't want to be r radically over it or under it. But the key idea of is that that Overton window can move and it's not a constant, right? Over time, like, I mean, 60 years ago, economic growth was not a cool idea or not the most important idea, but we now have changed. The Overton window has changed that growth is important. So, in, so the idea is, can we push that Overton window and that to push the Overton window, uh, we should uh, know public policy better uh, and that was the motivation. When you say Overton window, I mean something like a window of opportunity yeah, yeah. which opens and then, you know, it's open for a while and then it closes down. Yes. So you have to just get through yeah. somehow, mm. take, a, take a call and then just get through. And basically, is it uh, what you're looking at is for people to realize that uh, there is a possibility of uh, opening a Overton window here, uh, just if they make a little bit of pressure maybe because they are one of the stakeholders in the broad policy discussion and deliberation, democracy, whatever. Yeah, yeah, so the idea was can, if we want a positive change in a policy issue that we uh, desire, the idea is can we keep changing, moving the policy window. So for example, uh, the way you would do that is articulate a radical idea which might be outside the Overton window today, but over time as you keep uh, talking about it, as you keep uh, creating a community around it, maybe that Overton window will shift and then the window of opportunity will be will open, right? So uh, Kingdon schema also talks about it where there is, uh, you know, a policy change happens when three streams meet. There is a problem stream, so people recognize that there is a problem widely. And the second solution stream where actually people, it's not just enough to say that there is a problem, right? You should also have viable solutions. So when the solution meet is stream and the third stream is the political stream where even the people, broadly the politics and stakeholders are aligned in a way that that change can happen. So that can happen due to an urgent situation, that can happen due to many reasons, but the idea is can you uh, merge these three uh, streams, right? Often the focus in governance is always about that crisis or an urgent opportunity which causes the change. But our focus is uh, the other way. The idea is if we are ready with good solutions up front, if we are able to put that forward, if there is wide uh, sort of acceptability to an idea, then that change will happen, you know. So, uh, you know, that, uh, I, 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 the idea uh, will get implemented if there is wide acceptability. Classic example being economic reforms, right? The nine, uh, 19 reforms happened in 1991, but by 1981 itself, there were good proposals on the table. People had pu tried to push the Overton window in a particular direction, and after 10 years, it did happen. So that's that's the way. It's also interesting, you know. But uh, even more interesting is the fact that you have three major sections in your book. Now, these relate to these three meta-institutions that you talk about. One is the Sarkar, of course, but then the other two are Bazaar and Samaj. So, given the fact that public policy is basically, un I mean, most of the time it is thought of as a function of the government, the Sarkar. Mm. Mm. So, why so much emphasis on the other two? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, um, this idea of uh, Sarkar Samaj Bazaar has been talked by quite a few people uh, recently. Uh, Raghuram Rajan had written a book, Third Pillar, talking about it in the US context. Rohini Nilekani had written it from a philanthropic context. Uh, context. But I, we have this idea called societism. The idea behind societism is that uh, you know, if you place individual at the centroid of a triangle, imagine a triangle, then there are three vertices. The three vertices are Sarkar, Samaj, Bazaar. In the sense, the individual uh, 
interacts with all these three uh, meta institutions and all these three institutions have their own strengths and have their own weaknesses. For example, uh, the market is really important for an individual to express their preferences, express their innovativeness, etc. But market will be oblivious sometimes to uh, inequity concerns, right? Similarly, the Samaj gives a person the idea of belonging and uh, uh, an imagined identity. But uh, the uh, but the Samaj can also be majoritarian at times. So there are strengths and weaknesses and same, same with the state, right? State is, should provide the individual with the security uh, to go out, do what they want, the freedom to pursue any business, freedom to uh, uh, do what they want. But at times the state can also be overpowering, right? So these are strengths and weaknesses in each institution. And our idea is that uh, we should recognize that these are three institutions and try to play at the strengths of each of them. Don't get the state to do the things that the market should be doing. Don't get the state to do the things that society should be doing. And that was the uh, whole concept. And that's why we thought it's important to locate uh, this uh, idea in a framework which calls Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. Because far too often, whenever we see a po policy problem or any problem in uh, India, state is the first line of call. That state should solve it. Uh, you know, uh, USB in the classic example, right? You would have seen recently that uh, there are multiple chargers, and that's why the government is now bringing in a, a policy that uh, all of you should only just have USB C charger. Now, why should the government get involved in this? What is the reason? Uh, sure, I would be happy to have one charger, but does the government need to come into this? What are the consequences when government? gets a policy like that, you know, what happens to innovation, what happens to other charging technologies, what happens when USB-C becomes old. These are the kinds of questions we need to ask and before saying that government should do something, right? And can we leave it to the markets to sort it out? Can we leave it to the society to sort it out? These are the kinds of questions which we wanted to think about and that's why we thought this framework is necessary. The other reason also was that it's not just the individual who interacts with these three, but the state also interacts with the society in many ways and the state also interacts with the markets in many ways, right? So. Uh, that also is sort of uh, important. So, for example, when the state puts price caps or when the state puts, um, you know, uh, uh, various uh, things like trying to do too many things at the same time, constrain uh, industry. We have, I have give, we've given many examples of how the state interferes in things which are uh, related to the markets and what can be the consequences of that. That is one. And uh, sec secondly, also from the state and the society, right? For example, a classic thing is oftentimes the government will say that our problem is that we are overpopulated or that's an, but I would say we, it's not, the problem is not overpopulation, the problem would be under governance, right? The idea is that we, uh, it's an issue, the population is yeah, what fact, it is. In, and in fact, in fact, you know, I was just coming to that, uh, that you had also talked a little bit about undersize or, you know, inadequate size of the government. Yeah. So, I, I mean, what exactly, I mean, do you think about, do, do you want, I mean, the government to be even more omnipresent, I mean, Maybe yeah. that would be, cons many would consider it as an interference in our lives, you know. Yeah, that's people probably, I mean, some of us may not want that much of government. That's a mischievous question, yeah. Ah. But, uh, yeah, so actually the initial title for this book was Omni Absent. Uh, in the sense, what the idea that we are trying to say is that the state is present in the areas where we don't want it to be and it is not present in the core areas where we want it to be, right? So, law and order, enforcement, basic public services, these are the core things that only the state can do. But we have somehow, you know, we are okay with the state not having that, and but we want the state to solve our USB-C charging problem and things like that, right? So, the idea was, can we get the state to focus on some things? But uh, it doesn't, definitely we don't want an omnipresent state. The idea was that we should recognize uh, that the state in India still has severe uh, capacity issues. You know, the idea is, uh, oftentimes uh, if, if we, the 
perception we have about the state is that you know there's a lot of bureaucracy it is too slow there are too many people less work gets done uh, there is only little uh, truth to it the idea is that we uh, if you look at any parameter related to the size of the state indian state it is small on many parameters right so for example if you normalize us population and indian population the us state which quote unquote is the a capitalist country and people think it's a small state it is actually uh, the number of people employed in the state are much uh, higher 2x 3x compared to india you know the expenditure and now again people would think that us is a capitalist state so government will be spending very little in their economy but 40% of their gdp comes from government spending right uh, so the idea is not that the gov uh, in the in the us that government is interfering in all things the idea is government has chosen fewer things and does those things much well invest more money in that focus is on smaller areas but do them well instead of uh, uh, our situation where we have spread the state too thin in too many areas uh, with the result being that we don't get the uh, uh, result we want so we want the state to be more capable not bigger and that capability uh, will mean employing more people in some of the core things right so like i was saying law and order everyone knows in enforcement and police we are severely understaffed judiciary we are severely we definitely need more capacity in those areas. also in taxation yeah in taxation <laughs> absolutely i work in the tax department yeah. so that is why I, absolutely Now, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, talking to you uh, makes us realize, uh, all of us, I think, uh, how complex public policy can be. But your book is, you know, not like that. So, so it's slightly different. You have quoted so many philosophers, you have quoted so many learned people. But the most interesting part, what I found, was the takeaways from the Indian movies. Diwal, Trishul, R.K. Gupta. So, 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 why, why, I mean, what made you do this? I mean, is it your interest in movies? It was something else? So, this is the genius of my co-author. Uh, he is uh, into movies a lot. So, that's how, and the idea was this is not meant to be a serious book. So, our, I, and as in it is a, talk, it, we want to t talk about serious things in a halka fulka way. That was at least the vision. So, the idea was, we should explain things to two uh, means one through indian examples and second through indian uh, pop culture references so that's where and the thing that we knew more about was movies so that's where uh, we started right and there are we keep writing about it for example uh, opportunity cost is a core idea in uh, economic reasoning which says that you know whenever you invest one rupee for something you don't get to invest it in some other thing so there's an opportunity cost involved for every action now you can express that in a in, in a movie way also right like sharukh khan uh, would say kuch khok kya haar kar jeetne wale ko hi to baaze kar kehte hain right or kuch paane ke liye kuch khona bhi padta hai these are all actually uh, are telling you about opportunity cost in a way right so the idea was to use uh, these references or when we are talking about atmanirbharta uh, the movie upkar and manoj kumar uh, and his idea gives a very uh, good sense of what self reliance is what it can do or the movie naya daur the classic which talks about the contest between the uh, between a capitalist mode and a socialist mode or the state and the society conflict also so those were some of the references we uh, wanted to use and movies gave us a good uh, uh, way to do that so there's, there's, there seems to be a lesson here you know so for all of us who may not have the time to go through those uh, you know lengthy literatures uh, the books on public policy and all at least the minimum that we can do is to watch, watch indian movies there will be many lessons for us and if we are able to grasp them i think we, some of us can end up becoming public policy specialist now uh, but uh, when I, i would add some of the lessons that the movie stage might be wrong so we might have to reflect <laughs> on that so that is isn't that true of the books also yeah that's true. that's true yeah so, so for example there is that uh, famous movie mohan joshi hazir ho and that movie talks about uh, the entire thing rent con rent control and the idea of uh, how landlords can be uh, usurious you know and uh, can be very so the lesson from that was uh, not P perhaps getting at the core of the issue that it is actually a public policy problem and the fact that we 
put rent control was what was leading to a situation where both the landlord didn't have the incentive to get the house in order and neither did the uh, residents have a good time there. So. I think after reading your book, I am going to watch some of the movies. And I think the audience, uh, anyone who reads your book is also going to, uh, uh, I mean, have some of them. Some now, positive externality. So, so, so a very, I mean, kind of, now let's move on to that, uh, what is it called, uh, quick fire questions, you know. Are you against socialism? Uh, as an economic ideology, yes. Uh, can you explain in a sentence? Why? Yeah. So, uh, what we say, we, we don't say that the state has no role. Uh, in fact, if you would see, we've said that the state does have a primary role, but we also, and we also say that society also has a primary role, uh, not just market. So, we are not talking about some libertarian uh, uh, paradise where the state doesn't exist. We want the state to do uh, core things, uh, but uh, socialism as an economic ideology has failed in many reasons. It, and the core idea is it does not value individual freedom and individual economic, political, social freedoms are really core uh, to what, uh, to expressing people's yeah, preferences. I, I, I think what may happen is that it may also depend on how exactly you define socialism, what exactly you mean by that word and term what kind of an ideology, you know, what extent you are going to kind of stretch the idea of socialism, maybe that. Uh, uh, I, I will just add to that when I, a great point that you made. I think socialism is more statism than societism and that yeah. statism is a problem, right? Uh, I am okay, actually so, uh, society has a very important role and uh, that's why the one full section on society, but it should not be that state is the one which will solve all our problems. That's the issue that. See, but the thing is that uh, in developing countries, very often it is said that the public administration is the problem. I mean, that is the public policy. So we keep on talking about policy, but administration and policy may not always be the same thing. Like, any, any views on that? Yeah, I, yeah. this is one thing that I would love to know your views on. But I, 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 there's definitely one angle to it that many problems of public policy are problems of public administration in our context, given that some of the core issues that we always face is of that of state capacity. That we have great intentions, but the problem comes when you look at, do you have the capacity to implement that great idea? And sometimes so, that is not So there. let me give you my take on that. Yeah. I fully agree with you. Hmm. And uh, I am here uh, in a training academy. Hmm. And what we do is exactly try to, you know, challenge that, I mean, deal with that challenge of capacity hmm. by training our officers. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So that is how we do it. Now coming, I think uh, we are moving towards the end, of course, and a uh, very interesting part of your book relates to the idea of India. Hmm. Now let's just talk about that. I mean, what exactly, how do you view India? Because ultimately, uh, so much of public policy uh, is there. Sometimes you talk to people and people say, Hamar hota. Aisa, hmm. aisa Ye, yes, all these things are, you know, th these things are maybe good for Europe, maybe US, but not, this is India. This is, this is not. Or you talk, especially go to villages and all that. Oh, and these are these things. I mean, they will not take you seriously. Mm. Is there something about India that you think is kind of some some inherent inherent characteristics and in what we are, uh, which probably creates this dilemma? Yeah. So I would say a yes and a no to uh, this answer. Uh, I'll say why no first, in the sense that uh, some of the core things that we are talking about, you know basic public services or, uh, you know, law and order, etc. It's, we don't have to change whole of India to, you know, fix these things. And it's not, uh, countries which have very different civilizational histories have been able to fix this, right? So, it's, uh, exceptionalism can't be the answer that we are not able to do some of the core things. But yes, there's a path dependence always in any history. We are where we are because of the pathways that we followed. And one argument that many people talk about, like uh, Arvind Subramaniam has written about precocious democracy, for example, the idea that we became a, a, a political democracy before the uh, before we had uh, economic development, in a sense, uh, that led to a situation where there is very less demand for public goods, but there is demand for either personal benefits or community benefits at a very narrow level, but not for public goods. So maybe that explains why some parts of our state we are not able to, there's no demand, you know, so. Do you, do you also see a kind of a conflict between, say, uh, civilization and the state, like sometimes, you know, 
I, I, like we have institutions like police, court and all, but uh, most of us, you know, are not very fond of going to a police station. Uh, many of us may have never gone there. We do not want to, you know, uh, make frequent rounds of our courts also. Is, is there a kind of a conflict there? Some, some yeah. yeah, so that was uh, no part of my answer, but yeah, and the, now I'll come to the yes part. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, so there are some, uh, uh, again, I, this is a path dependence uh, idea, right? The fact that uh, we also have a social revolution encoded in, hard coded in our uh, constitution, right? The idea that the state has to do many things and which actually have helped us in uh, most of the ways and it was a positive thing. But that also poses challenges, right? When state tries to do uh, many things which the society might not be fully on board, then there are uh, clashes, right? And I guess that we are seeing uh, in uh, being played right now as well. So, uh, I guess that is one core idea, but there are many conceptions of India, right? India as a nation, India as a state, India as a civilizational state. Uh, so, uh, all of those are true, right? I, I th we are one nation which has been uh, built by many experiences. Uh, so, that identity exists, an imagined identity of the Indian exists, that uh, we also have the Indian Republic, which is the Indian state, so uh, it overlaps with the nation in some way. And also there is that civilizational idea, which uh, goes back to uh, many, many years and that also uh, interplays with all this. But I would still say some of those core challenges, I mean, we are, the book is not about changing India or idea of India, I'm like not the best person uh, to think of India at that scale. But I am thinking, at least for the public policy issues, many states with different histories, different civilizational contexts have solved some of the issues and we should be able to do those so as well. Yeah, so listening to you, you know, uh, it's taken me back to some of the time, those times when I was more involved in public policy. These days I'm more involved in probably taxation and not even taxation, actually more administrative matters. But yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of eye-opening some of those views. And uh, that is the reason probably we should be going back to the book, we should be, it's book worth reading, you know, I, that much I can tell you, I congratulate you, you too yeah. for that book and the most important part the is… The teacher has given me good grades. No, no, it's written in a, such a lucid manner, I mean, it, uh, all movies and uh, you're talking about Shah Rukh Khan and, you know, uh, Amitabh Bachchan and so, so, so many, uh, Dilip Kumar, of course, so, I can't forget him. Yeah, I fear that yeah, uh, the book is actually a bit, in, in those references, it's a bit dated, so I apologize to all the younger people here that you might find those names, but maybe it will give you an opportunity to see some of the old classics. So Shah please do that. Khan is not Shah Rukh Khan, <laughs> but there are, it's like, yeah, there's Dilip Kumar and Manoj Kumar. Yeah, not and even Amitabh Bachchan, I mean, he's still there. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's, so that, that's how it is. So you, we are not outdated as yet. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are more or less coming to the close of this conversation, but uh, yeah, maybe uh, it's, we can open it for the question and answers. We can throw the session open to the audience for only a couple of questions. Uh, hi, hi Pranay. So, uh, like we see that a lot of the people ha have like strong opinions about like, you know, the part party affiliations and whether they are pro-government or opposed, like against the government, right? And uh, because of because that they are against let's say the current dispensation they will oppose farm laws which may in fact be a, a good policy uh, uh, proposal right so in this case how do we break the nexus between you know like the party affiliations and uh, good public policy and how do we make uh, people more aware uh, that like about like how to think in terms of policies and so that to, so that the demand side is fixed uh, in some sense your name pranav Oh, Pranav. Okay. Uh, thanks, Pranav. So, um, yeah, great question. Uh, I think in public policy, and we, have, we please add to all this as well, but um, one thing that you would like to do is, see, it's completely fair for uh, the opposition political party to question this, right? There's no problem with that. But it is on to the way you would get through this would be something that people talked about aligning cognitive maps, right? So in the sense, 
any uh, po public policy that you achieve, it will always have winners and losers. There is no public policy which, is, which ha has no losers. And even the worst of public policy has some benefits. Okay? So, uh, the, this is one thing we have to remember. So, it is often in a democracy, it is up to the government to think of how do you align the cognitive maps primarily of the people who are going to lose out. You know, uh, so how do you get them on board? And there are many examples in Indian public policy where this has been done. You know, the fact that how all state governments were uh, got on board for the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act, right? Uh, why would any government say, I have to restrict my expenditure? They wouldn't, right? You would say, why would they do it? But they did. Because the, uh, the union government got them on board, gave them some relaxations, uh, gave them some ways to align their cognitive maps. Similarly, the NPS reform, right, national pension system, which is at risk now, but the way it was done again was very, really smart where it was applied to people who were not already in the government. So there was no opposition. I mean, imagine there was this reform which said that your pension, the people who are working in the government will go, uh, might go down in the sense it will be uh, connected with the markets uh, rather than you having an assured uh, uh, defined benefit scheme, you know. Now you, from today's point of view, it will say like, why will anyone agree, right? People would be on the streets protesting it, but they didn't, you know. There was a policy which was brought about that got people on board and there were no uh, people accepted it uh, at that time, right? So the idea is that uh, we all have different conceptions of how the world works, how the what the goal of public policy should be, uh, and that's fine. You know, we all have different cognitive maps. It is off to the government and public policy to think of those interests, stakeholder interests, and see how you can align some of those cognitive maps. Some of the interests you can't align, and that the government can say, you know, it's not possible. But to the extent you can, you will have to. Uh, if you don't, you see the kind of results that you saw during farm laws, right? That there was this policy seems good, but the stakeholders who were going to, who felt that they were legitimately going to be uh, affected adversely, the government was not able to probably reach out and align their cognitive maps, tell them how this can benefit them, get them on board. Uh, so maybe that is one way. So uh, to add to that, uh, I mean, all I would like to say is that, see, ultimately, uh, a state, a government, these are all political processes. So when we talk about uh, policy, uh, most of the time we are thinking about economic efficiency. But the players who are finally going to decide are actually political players. And that includes the bureaucracy. I mean, let's not forget them. Then. They are also, they, they, they are part of that political process. And so it's almost impossible anywhere in the world to have a complete objectivity and decision making based on com pure public welfare. That never happens. It's always stakeholders, it's you or me. And very few occasions are there when it's a win-win game for everyone. Some winners are there, some losers are there, and the, my allies should not lose. And we talk, we teach about this in the courses as well, that there is no policy without politics, you know. Uh, there's poli politics is always there, you know, three people meet, politics starts. It's not just electoral politics. So, idea about politics is to, and I mean, people in the government know this much, much better than uh, we do. Uh, but sometimes there are reasons why things don't uh, work out. Okay, uh, so since we're running short of time, I would request the readers to take their questions uh, downstairs because the author will be available downstairs as well. Uh, thank you so much, um, Mr. Kotastane, for this wonderful session. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and I'm sure that our readers now have a lot more clarity about how public policy works and how much do we really know about it. Um, appreciation is the best expressed in gestures rather than words. So as a token of our appreciation, we would like to present the author with a unique painting made specially for him by Pranav Brahmankar from the Alag Angle community. I request Pranav Bra Brahmankar to kindly be here on the stage and I request the moderator to present the painting to our author.
we are glad to be associated with the Alag Angel community, which is certainly full of a lot of talent. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the beautiful session. <laughs>